In this, the third in a series looking at struct and class properties and methods, we're going to take a look at property observers. Property observers observe and respond to changes in a property's value. They are called every time a property value is set, even if the new value is the same as the property's current value. Will set is called just before the value is stored, and did set is called immediately after the new value is stored. We'll take a look at how you can use them to simplify your code and to work more on encapsulating your code. If you're interested in this, keep watching. The first thing that you have to know about property observers is that they can only apply to stored properties. They can't be used with computer properties that we covered in an earlier video. When you declare a stored property, you have the option to define property observers with blocks of code to be executed when a property is set. The will set observer runs before the new value is stored, and the did set observer runs after, and they run regardless of whether the old value is equal to the new value. Let's use this playground to see what we mean. I'll start out with this string variable called name, and it's assigned the default value of unknown. With property observers, you can set up code blocks with both will set blocks and did set blocks inside. For will set, you have access to the new value that is being set. Any code inside here gets executed before the value is set. In the did set block, you have access to the old value before the property value is set. This code is executed after the value has been set. By adding these print statements in the code block, we can see the order in which they are executed when I change or set the value of name. So what are some uses for property observers? Though I'm sure there are some good reasons for using will set, I must admit that I've never done so. For that reason, I'm going to focus on did set. One good example is if you want to correct or change an input value. For example, let's assume that all names are capitalized. There are some exceptions, but you can likely fix that with your own logic. So let's keep it simple and assume the general case. I'll first comment out the previous example so as not to confuse us with the print statements. I'll repeat the same variable, but this time I'll only use the did set block. Within the block, whenever the name is changed, I'd like to make sure that it is capitalized behind the scenes. It's easy to do, simply saying name is equal to name.capitalized. Now if I set name to Stuart Lynch with no capitals, and I print it out, or use it somewhere in my UI, I see that it is now always capitalized. The one thing that you have to be aware of is that property observers do not apply when the value is initialized. If I go back and change the original name from unknown with a capital to unknown lowercase and comment out our name assignment, we can see that our print statement runs, but unknown is not capitalized. Another common use for the did set property observer is validation. Again, let's comment out the previous code to keep our console clean. And here we have a person struct that has both a name and an age. Now recall that did set blocks don't run when a person struct is initialized. So we'll use the default values for a name and person that obviously needs to be changed. We can assume that a person can change his name, but we want it capitalized as before. So let's set up the did set code block like this. For the age, we want to verify that the record is never changed to make the age younger than it was before. In that case, we can compare the age that is set to the old value. In our did set block for this variable, we check if the assigned value is less than the old value. If it is, we can set the assigned value back to the old value. We can test this out by creating a new person. We can assign a name and an age after the instant creation so that our did set blocks will be executed whenever that change is made. I'm going to add this print statement to check how our did set blocks are working. Let me add a year to his age. That seems to work. 
Now let me try and make the age younger. Notice how the did set error message is printed out and the age is reset back to his previous age. However, if I add to his age and make it greater, no error is displayed and it's accepted. Data entry verification is an excellent use of did set and with it, you can modify different UI elements in your code block to provide the user with beneficial feedback. Before I leave this playground, I'd like to provide an example where you can use did set to your advantage. In Combine and Swift UI, there is such a thing as an observable object, and you can set different properties of the object to be published. This means that whenever the item changes, the observing view is notified and it triggers an update of the view. Here's an example of a user setting observable object that has two published properties that are initialized by reading values from user defaults. If no corresponding key is found, a default value is assigned, or in the case of the Boolean, it's automatically set at false. These objects can be passed around from view to view, and as such, the properties can be modified. If we want to update the user defaults value when one of these values is modified, this is a perfect use for did set. Each time the property changes, we save it back to user defaults so that we have persistence between sessions. The final example is for UIKit, and it's a good example of MVC, Massive View Controller. And my goal here is to do some refactoring using property observers to clean up the code somewhat. First, an overview of the application. It's a simple to-do list that has a button that will hide any completed items. That's all. It's not a fully fleshed out example. The example uses an array of to-dos. In the model, notice that there are three stored properties, title, a string, priority, a enum, and completed, a boolean. The image and color properties are computed properties with the values assigned depending on the priority value, so a different color and image used for each priority. The static function is a class method so that I can seed my array when I initialize it. We see this happen back in our view controller. When the show hide button is tapped, the is filtered boolean is toggled, and the array that I use to display the list is either going to be the entire list of to dos or the list filtered to exclude completed. And the table then is reloaded. The table view itself uses a custom cell with three text labels. One for title, the priority, and the icon. This is all pretty standard stuff. The cell for row at index path function receives the to do item from the index path and then creates a cell using the custom cell and populates the text fields with corresponding values. There's some UI work going on here too, using a string extension to strike through the text if the item is completed. I'm sure that many of you have view controllers that look like this. So let's take a stab at cleaning it up. First of all, the action that toggles the is filtered button should just do that. It shouldn't be doing the UI stuff. That's the responsibility of the variable itself. If I want to know what happens when is filtered is changed, no matter how that change happens, whether it's through this action or some other method, I want to see that code there. So let's just cut it out of the action and create a did set property observer for is filtered and paste it in there. problem solved. The second thing I don't like is all of the UI code that is taking place here in the cell for row at index path function. It has no business doing that here because it is the cell itself that is being modified. So I'm going to go to the to do cell and create an instance of to do. And I know that the only way that this class is going to be accessed is if there is a to do that gets passed to it so I can safely unwrap it. Returning to the view controller, when I have a to-do item, I can assign that to the cells version of to-do. Well, what do I want to do now? I want to fill in the text fields on the cell. So I'm just going to cut all of this stuff out of here where it doesn't belong and return to my to-do cell and set up a did set code block and paste it in here. We can remove the references to cell because we are in the cell. Much nicer. 
We can test our app out now and see that it's working just as before. And my view controller is also cleaner. There's much more that I could do, like moving the data source out of here to another file, but that'll have to wait for another day. Well, that's it for my three videos on properties. I'll leave links in the notes below that will point you to the other two previous videos. The first was on computed properties, getters and setters, and the second we discussed instance methods, static properties, mutable methods, and access rights. I hope you found this video useful. If so, please give it a thumbs up below and subscribe to my channel. If I get enough positive feedback, I'll continue to build out similar tutorials for Swift developers who have left the starting gate but still need to add to their toolbox. You can check out my YouTube channel to see what other videos I've created. Visit my website to see my iOS app portfolio of apps currently on the App Store. And check out my GitHub repository to see what else I'm up to. Thanks for watching. I'm most active on Twitter, so follow me there for notifications of other Swift-related things that I'm up to.